thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to Money Show's Accredited Investors Virtual Expo and our next presentation. My name is Natasha and I'm your host. I am pleased to introduce Natalie Pace, who is the co-creator of Earth Gratitude Project and the author of Amazon bestsellers, The ABCs of Money, which is in its fifth edition that was just released, The ABCs of Money for College, The Gratitude Game, and Put Your Money Where Your Heart Is. That last book is an original ESG investing book, and the second edition was just released. Today, Ms. Pace will be discussing what's safe in a debt world for both equities and fixed income. There will be some time at the end of the presentation for questions. Please type your questions in the chat and I will present them. Thank you, Natalie, and everyone for joining us. And Natalie, we look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much for having me. Um, great, can you everybody see me now? Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen and talk to you, um, you know, as we go through, because a lot, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So here we go, let me show you a few things here. All right, so there's, that's who I am. And I've been doing this now for 20 years. So, um, you know, I've certainly seen a lot in all this time. So what's safe in a debt world? And we are definitely, there is no doubt, we are in a debt world. It's the leverage that is happening today worldwide is unprecedented. So we have to be cognizant of that. That's not just a flashy title to get you to tune into this. So over half of the S&P 500 companies are at or near junk bond status. It's really important for you to realize that the higher the dividend, the higher the risk. So here's some of the risk that's out there. And what happens, as you can see here with Cushman and Wakefield, um, CBRE, is that if they get a credit downgrade, then they may have to stop paying the dividend and their share price will drop immediately. So, you know, you have uh, the, you know, you may be thinking, oh, well, I want to earn an income. So I want these yields. I want this dividend. But if your principal is at risk of, plummeting, then that little tiny bit of yield that you're getting may not be worth it. The next screen shows you that in spades. The NASDAQ, which is rich in growth, biotech technology has almost tripled the returns of the blue chip index, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, where there tends to be, of course, there are some uh, you know, growth companies in there and um, newer companies, but they tend to have a lot of the older companies with heavier debt and much slower growth. Sometimes there's even stagnating growth or negative growth. So the best thing that you can do is to always be properly diversified and to have at least an, um, a percent equal to your age safe. Now in today's world where there's a lot, there's no value. It's getting trounced by growth, as we saw in this slide. I'm saying consider even having replacement funds for your value. So you always wanna have large, medium, small, and in most worlds, uh, you're gonna to wanna to have value and growth, but in an over leveraged debt world, first of all, especially when stocks are at an all time high, What's on sale? Where's the value, right? Secondly, they're just not performing. Thirdly, they may be carrying more risk than you realize. And even if they're giving you a small yield, it could be that it's either subject to capital loss or very much underperforming the market. So we're gonna talk about ways that you could think about value replacements. Look, Wall Street right now is trying to come up with a new definition of what da of Wall Street should be. I don't think you should wait for that to happen. I think you should be getting the memo now and considering other ways that you can add performance and reduce the risk in your equity side, the at-risk side, the stock side. And we're gonna talk about that too. So one of the ways is that you could consider adding in hot countries. Like for instance, China is still supposed to grow at 8% GDP this year. And because the headlines have been negative in the US and China, a lot of the um, equities and the ETFs are trading pretty low. 
So maybe you could think about a large value replacement and have China be that. Also, some of these other countries like Peru and Chile are um, benefiting from copper prices being at an all time high. In fact, their GDP growth is expected to be extremely high this year at the highest in the world, Chile at 11 and Peru at two. So you could consider, hey, maybe I wanna add um, those as a mid cap or a small cap value replacement. Maybe I look for some funds that are based out of Peru and Chile. You could consider Colombia. That's another one that's going to be very high growth as well. So again, knowing where the growth is and where there's not going to be as much growth, and this is a recently updated um, IMF map for GDP growth. We also want to remind you that when you use our uh, pie, which are you know registered trademark pie chart system. It's it, with annual rebalancing. It's a buy low, sell high plan on autopilot. One of the most important things that you need to do in a debt world is to regularly rebalance once, twice, or three times a year. Not You don't really need to do it more than that unless you have a lot of individual companies. But if you're using funds once, twice, or three times a year, then you, you know, if you're using the pie chart system, if the slice gets super high, you, you sell high. If the slice gets very skinny, you either say, is this not great? Like maybe I should replace my value funds with other countries, or you say, maybe I should just buy more at a lower price. So this is how you can keep the at-risk equity side growing, even in volatility that's created in a debt world that is fueled by low interest rates, which creates asset bubbles. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through our slideshow as well. So it's also a reminder that your emotions are not your friend in investing. So typically, like right now, we just had another up day in the markets and stocks are near an all time high. And that's when people wanna start buying in or you get very excited about companies that have already shot the moon and you want to buy into them, whereas other companies that could be really have a lot of fundamental reasons why they could shoot the moon, um, you aren't interested in them because they're very low priced. So our emotions often jack us in the wrong direction. The pie chart takes the emotions out of it. Also, what I'm seeing a lot of is emails where they're saying, look, the dollar is going to become worthless because we have too much money floating around. So will cryptocurrency or real estate or gold become the only thing of value when the dollar becomes worthless? Well, I think you should worry a little bit that you might be buying into a pump and dump pay to play marketing ploy. And the reason for that is that I saw the same thing happen with gold in 2012 when gold was at an all time high and then it crashed and it stayed there for, you know, till basically 2019. We saw that with cryptocurrency in 2017 and then it crashed and it stayed that through, stayed there through the um, pandemic. And then of course it did go back up, but these kind of boom and bust cycles are, are very indicative of, again, that marketing plans or somebody who's trying to make, um, make bank on your naivete. And a lot of times they convince you that that's the only thing that you should be doing. So if you are interested in gold or crypto, we'll talk about real estate separately. That's not going to be part of your pie chart because your pie chart is your liquid assets. It's part of your wealth. You want to have real estate. I don't think you should be buying high right now, but you do want to have real estate. So if you are interested in crypto or silver or gold, then think about having a hot slice of it. As you can see in this pie sample pie chart, we have small, medium, large value and growth. That makes up six of our 10 slices. And then we have four hots, what you think is hot. And that's going to both add performance to your portfolio, but it also allows you to try some of these things that you are interested in. In fact, somebody even asked me, well, if I think that 
the that stocks are at an all time high. And I think that maybe they're going to come down. Should I buy just a put option on maybe the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Well, if you want to do that, understand that options are much higher risk and also your window of opportunity needs to be long enough for you to be right. But the second thing is it shouldn't be your only strategy. Maybe it's just a hot slice. So real estate prices, and again, we're going to kind of go now to the other, uh, a broader view of what's safe in a debt world. Real estate prices are back to an all time high and are unaffordable in many cities. Now, I will say this, in a world where there's too much paper money floating around, hard assets may hold their value better, but that doesn't mean that you should buy high because that can be the worst situation ever if you become the most debt-laden person in a debt world. You have to be very careful of that because the last major recession, real estate prices plummeted to about half of their value in a lot of markets. So remember that with regard to real estate, you have to really apply the three ingredient recipe for cooking up profits. You also need to buy what you can afford. I am encouraging people to understand, uh, you know, what's gonna be um, monetized in a post pandemic world. I know a lot of landlords that are suffering due to the eviction moratorium, or maybe they were an Airbnb host and there's just not as much travel happening. So what's going to be safe income producing hard asset in a post pandemic world that you buy for a good price. We'll, we'll kind of highlight that obviously in a 30 minute uh, presentation, we're not gonna be able to go through all of it. But I think the real headline here is be careful of buying high. If the markets turn and you're stuck with a house that's where it's um, the mortgage is underwater or the house is underwater on the mortgage, it can really ruin your life for a very long time and your credit score goes in the toilet. So one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand about crypto is the average holding time of Bitcoin is less than three months. Other cryptocurrency coins are even more actively traded. So a lot of people think, and you're getting sold into this idea that you better buy and hold because Bitcoin's gonna become a million dollars a coin and everything else is gonna be completely worthless. And the reality is that people are buying and selling and the average hold time is less than three months. And every time it hits it high, the whales go in and capture gains and it just goes very sharply down. That doesn't, it is incrementally increasing in value. So there is um, definitely a reason to like it. I personally do invest in crypto, hot slice, but at this point, I'm be, and also because I have a heavy emphasis on sustainability, I'm more interested in the lower energy coins they're also a better bargain and they do have more volatility than Bitcoin at this point. So that creates opportunity too, if you have um, a buy low sell high plan or a rebalancing plan in place. So in other words, if you're aligning your expectation of what's gonna happen with, the, um, with what is likely to happen. So if you think that Bitcoin is buy and hold, but everybody else is trading it actively, then um, you know you are definitely putting yourself in emotional roller coaster because when it goes up, you're going to be very elated, and when it crashes, you're going to be really devastated and worried. And also, if you have a, a lot of money in Bitcoin and it goes down to half of its value, your credit score goes down, your ability to buy other assets goes down, and you have to wait to recover from losses. That's very, very um, hard emotionally. It's hard financially. It could be hard on your family and your relationships as well. So gold is very volatile. It is the lowest performing asset of the last 10 years. Also, it's important to remember that when gold crashes, it can take a long time to recover. So, you know, when gold hit its highs in 1980, it took 25 years to recover. When gold hit its high in 20, uh, 2012, 2011, um, you know, it was in the toilet for, until about 2020, 2019. So that's a very long time to have an asset that's that far underwater. But on the other hand, 
The last time gold hit its high was when the S&P um, S Global downgraded the U.S. credit to AA+, and that happened August 5th of 2011. Fitch Ratings currently has the U.S. Um, um, AAA rating on a negative outlook. So if the debt ceiling and budget are not resolved by December 3rd, uh, we, we do have um, a high likelihood of a credit downgrade from Fitch and probably Moody's as well. So that is positive for gold. Um, it's, I believe, even more positive for silver because silver and gold usually both run in tandem. In fact, the last time when gold hit its all-time high, so did silver. And now silver is about half of where it was when it hit its all-time high, whereas gold is pretty close to its all-time high. So I think the upside potential, if you're interested in that kind of play, is silver. The other side too, though, is that it is positive for cryptocurrency be, um, if we get a credit downgrade because crypto is the new gold. So again, there are a lot of other cryptos outside of just Bitcoin that you might want to look into. And if you're more interested and worried about the energy hog status of Bitcoin and Ethereum, there are altcoins that have uh, a lower energy usage. So here are the 10 year returns of various assets. As you can see, large stocks are the outperformers. That's uh, atypical. And that's got a lot to do with our debt world uh, and printing up $5 trillion. It was much easier for the large companies to access that capital, even if they had a very low credit score than it was for the small companies. And that's why you've seen the large caps um, overperforming. As you can see here, gold is really the underperformer over the last 10 years. And that has a lot to do with 2012 being the high and then crashing down and still now, only now in the last year or two, starting to come back. Real estate is trending above its long-term average too, which could indicate anytime you see an asset trending above its long-term average, it's usually an indication of maybe being bubblicious. So as you can see here, uh, small caps typically outperform large caps and gold typically performs better than it has for the past 10 years. So, you know, gold may be undervalued, large cap stocks may be overvalued, real estate may be overvalued. And there are many, many, many other indicators that would indicate the same thing. Now, I think it's important to realize that, that all equities are very expensive right now. This is from the Federal Reserve Board Financial Stability Report. And I quote, should have risk appetite decline from elevated levels, a broad range of asset prices could be vulnerable to large and sudden declines. So what does that mean? You know, real estate and stock prices are really high. They're very elevated. They're very expensive. In fact, this is a, a ratio, a 10-year average of price earnings ratios done by Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winning economist. And it was last year that the most over leveraged periods of stocks were number one, dot com recession, right before the dot com recession, number two, Great Depression, 1929, and number three, today. Now, it's dot com today and the Great Depression has fallen to number three. Now, before today, when you thought about the Great Depression, you probably thought about, you know, speculation in stocks, right? OK, so today it's even more speculative. Very important to realize that a debt world and low interest rates in particular create asset bubbles. So again, what can you do about it? Well, if you're really worried, overweight, safe, pretend you're a little older than you are. So one of the best things that you could do before a recession was simply overweight safe, because if stocks drop by half and you're 50, you overweighted 20% safe, then your 30% in equities only went down by 15. So your overall portfolio only went down about 15%. And in a normal world where bonds give you a yield, your bond portfolio could have made up the losses and kept you either buoyant or maybe even ready to, ready to rock and roll again. Um, so if you 
think that the markets are over leveraged or that we could be due for a recession for whatever reason, the right answer isn't market timing or jumping out of equities. It's actually overweighting safe because you can't fight the Fed, you can't fight the treasury. We learned that lesson in March of 2020. Okay, so more additional information on what's safe in a debt world. So bonds are illiquid and negative yielding. So this is a liquidity chart and it shows you here that US corporate bonds, there's not many buyers on the other side of the table should you wish to sell them. And the truth is that this was a problem before the pandemic. Bonds and Dow Jones industrial stocks, Dow Jones stocks, so more of the blue chip oriented stocks, those were not as liquid as you know, one to three year treasuries, S&P 500, gold, et cetera. So it's really important for you to realize that you're not getting paid to take on the risk in bonds today. So underweighting bonds or making sure that you have short term and credit worthy, uh, whether it's a T-bill or whatever kind of bond it is, is very important. Also, keep your money. You know, I, I'm reminded of a quote by Roy Rogers where he said, I'm more, return, I'm more concerned with the return of my money than the return on my money. You're really not getting paid to take on risk today. And there's a boatload of risk out there. So, you know, keeping your money, capital preservation affords you the liquidity you need to be able to buy low if markets correct. So think about FDIC insured cash and short-term credit-worthy bonds or T-bills. You know, you have to worry about bonds, money market funds, annuities, REITs. If any of this stuff in red concerns you, you can get additional information in the ABCs of money. There's an entire section on what's safe in a debt world. I'll talk about that in just a moment. So safe income producing hard assets that you purchase for a good price considering a post-pandemic world, that can be helpful. The problem is right now, um, it's hard to know what's gonna be great in a post-pandemic world for producing income and you're buying high in most markets for your real estate. So just remember that in uh, bonds could offer a credit worthy yield by 2024 because they are, interest rates are predicted to rise. They'll start rising a little bit next year, a lot more in 2023, and even more in 2024. Also, rising interest rates could create more opportunities for real estate as well, because there, and additionally, if there's more supply because we've just built a few more things. So be patient. Being a patient buyer and an opportunistic seller is always going to be beneficial. Also, every bill you eliminate could be the best yield in a debt world. Is solar right for you? Do you live in a sunny state? Electric cars can save up to half of gasoline costs. Uh, work from home could save a lot too. Gas prices are trending higher and they're pretty high, which is gonna also affect the airline industry, but it affects consumers, which slows down GDP growth and shows up there. So think, these are all things that I um, talk about more in my book, The ABCs of Money, ways that you can eliminate bills. And again, this can be forever if you properly insulate your house, if you power with solar, um, these kinds of things. So also put your money where your heart is, is an original ESG investing guide. So if sustainability is something that matters to you, um, the second edition was just published, go to nataliepace.com to make sure that you're accessing the second edition of the of Put Your Money Where Your Heart Is and the fifth edition of the ABCs of Money. So one last thing before we go to questions is that I do have a retreat coming up. Uh, this weekend, it's online, so you can join us from wherever you are. We even have people who join us from Europe. And, um, you know, it talks about all this. What's safe in a debt world is so important that we spend one full day on what's safe. That's how important it is. And that's also how many resources we have for you to look into. Again, you know, I'm just having to highlight a slide and maybe mention it for a minute. 
imagine how much more you can learn if we work on it for a day. All right, so I'm going to turn it back over to you guys for questions and um, let me know what you what you have. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Our first question is, since this is an accredited investor focused expo, are there certain private investments, equity or et cetera, that you feel are particularly viable at this point in time? Thanks. Thanks. I think that it's really important to realize that, you know, this low interest rate environment that creates asset bubbles, it can really affect all assets. And some of the greatest risk out there that I see are actually private placement opportunities for accredited investors. So I would just be very careful. And, you know, the higher the dividend, the higher the risk. There's a lot of people that are chasing one or 2% returns, and they really don't realize just how much risk they are of capital loss. So what I would say is that there is a lot of low hanging fruit. A lot of it is by eliminating the bills um, in your own portfolio, rather than trying to chase some sort of vehicle that others may have packaged for you. And I've certainly he heard about a lot of packages and there are many that are in my view, a little bit macabre, but um, yeah. I mean, if you if you have any specifically that you want us to look into, we're always interested in looking into them. So please feel free to just email info at nataliepace.com. And it may be that we've already written a blog at addressing that particular type of asset or that I want to write a blog about it. So um, we've had a lot of people that were approached by private placement REITs because they do offer a great yield. But, um, you know, many of the people that that took the bait have lost an enormous amount of capital even already. And that's with, you know, a flush with cash and the interest rate still very low. Okay. Thank you. Here's a question for you. Do you, well, a follow-up question is what do you mean by eliminating the bills? Yeah. So as an example, if you live in a sunny state and you put solar on your own house, right? A lot of times that can give you a 15% yield when you're thinking about the money that you save. So if you can take a 350, I, someone else I was talking about this, they said their electric bill was $1,200 every month. So if you can take that down to 35 or $40 a month, and that's like having a bond that pays you $300 a month yield. So a lot of times, and, and by the way, right now on your clean energy products or um, a great deal of these energy efficiency products, that's 26% tax credit. So that really reduces the amount that you're spending on it as well meaning that your payback time might be three or four years. So um, that electric vehicle, if you're cutting out um, your gasoline costs and you're powering it with solar, the yield, if you were considering this as a bond, could go up to 20% yield. So those kinds of things when you think about eliminating bills in your life. Okay, great. And do you uh, one, like I do want to say one more thing. Um, one more thing that I encourage people to do is think about keeping the money in the family. So one other way that you can kind of eliminate bills in your life is to think about intergenerational housing. Um, people don't realize that intergenerational housing right now is higher than it was before uh, it was in the Great Depression, depression in 1929. And the reason for that is that a lot of people think, you know what, we can keep the money in the family. We can pay um, less on our housing costs as a family unit and everybody gets to take more vacations or invest more, have more liquidity and all of that. So I would say, you know, think about legacy planning. Think And, and when you're doing that, don't just think about how you're going to will your kids, your 401k or your IRA. But is there a way now that you can empower them? Because millennials and Gen Z really need it right now. Thank you for that. Do you like multi-asset mutual funds for bonds like investing such as Fidelity's multi-asset fund? Um, I think that right now bonds are vulnerable, negative yielding and um, you know, also liquidity issues. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll say this in another way. At the start of the pandemic recession, the feds printed up a whole bunch of money. What a lot of people don't realize they bought over 1200 individual bonds and they bought a lot of ETFs that would have failed as well. So um, in general, I think that you're better. It, look, if an asset is weak, 
if it's if it's not in favor because as you know there isn't there is a correlation when interest rates rise the bond value goes down so when an asset is weak the etf or the fund tends to be even weaker Okay, thank you for that insight. And it is 5.30, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up, but I wanna thank you and everyone who joined us today. We certainly appreciate your insights and information, and I hopefully someone will be joining you at your retreat from our presentation today. All right, thanks so much for having me. And you guys, again, there's a lot of resources in the book, but at the retreat, it's three days. First day is nest egg investing. Second day is increasing performance and decreasing uh, leverage and um, weakness. And the third day is what's safe all day long. Great. Fantastic. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, guys.